This is a course about solving differential equations. So let's start with the obvious. What is a differential equation? Well, an algebraic equation is an equation with numbers and one or more variables. Here's the simple equation t plus 5 equals 7. This equation implicitly asks a question. What number can be the letter t? What does the letter t stand for? In every algebraic equation, the same implicit question exists. What can the variable be such that the equation works? For this algebraic equation, only t equals 2 satisfies. That's the solution. This equation has a unique solution. Of course, many things can happen. There might be a single solution, many solutions, or no solutions at all. If there are no solutions, well, that fact may depend on the number set in consideration. Maybe there are no rational solutions, but there are real solutions or complex number solutions. A differential equation is like an algebraic equation, but it is now an equation of functions, not of numbers. The elements of the equation are different functions of some fixed independent variable, in this case t. Like an algebraic equation, a differential equation is always implicitly a question. Where an algebraic equation asks what number, a differential equation asks what function. Here, the variable is written f, and written f of t to make it clear that it is a function of the very independent variable t. A differential equation always includes a function and one or more of its derivatives, hence the name. It asks for a property of the function. In this case, what function has a derivative which is three times the original function? Like an algebraic equation, it can have many solutions, one unique solution, or no solutions at all. And like an algebraic equation, the judgment that it has no solutions may depend on the set of functions under consideration. The order of a differential equation is the highest degree derivative. This equation only has a first derivative, so it is a first order differential equation. If there is only one independent variable, as is the case here with a variable t, then this is called an ordinary differential equation, or ODE for short. I could also consider partial derivatives of a multivariable function. Differential equations for these types of functions and derivatives are called partial differential equations, or PDEs. In general, a differential equation is any equation involving a function and its derivatives. This includes, of course, a huge range of strange expressions. Most of these are nonsense. Here is a differential equation that I can basically guarantee no one has ever written down before. I have no idea if it has a solution or not, and really I don't have any way to find out. But thankfully, most of the DEs that mathematics actually spends time on are of particular forms, ones which have particular solution methods. And most of these forms reflect some problem in applied mathematics, and I'll spend a lot of time in this course talking about the real-world problems that lie behind many of these DEs. For now, let me define some terminology for these forms. An autonomous first-order ODE is an equation of this form. The first derivative is isolated on the right, and the left is some expression in the dependent variable y. The independent variable never shows up on the right. Note that, to talk about an expression in y, I use the symbol f of y, but be careful with this notation. y of t is the function under consideration here. The solution to this differential equation is some function y of t. f of y is a nice way of writing in the abstract that the right side is some expression in y. The function f is part of the equation, but it's not the solution I'm looking for. It's not the function I'm looking for. This use of other functions to give the general form of a differential equation is common. So be aware and always pay close attention to what actually is the function you're looking for. In this case, it is y of t. A very common kind of differential equation is a linear differential equation. Unsurprisingly, in a linear equation, the pieces are multiplied by things and added together. For differential equations, though, the multiplicative factors are other functions, not constants. This is a first-order linear ODE. It has the function y and its derivative dy dt. Each of these has a coefficient, like a polynomial. But the coefficients are now functions themselves, not just constants. a of t and b of t are the coefficient functions. There's also a coefficient without y or its derivatives, and that's written c of t here. 
All of these pieces are added together to form a linear differential equation. It's convenient to write the C of t alone on the right and everything else on the left. A second order linear equation is similar, but now with a second derivative as well. Again, all the terms on the left have a coefficient function, a of t, b of t, and c of t, and there is another function, d of t, on the right. All the terms are added together in the linear structure. And this could be extended to any order. We're not going to deal with high order linear equations in this course, but the pattern here is this. It looks very much like a polynomial, but with orders of derivatives instead of powers of a variable. Lastly, the linear equation is homogeneous if the function on the right is zero. So c of t in the first, d of t in the second. If that happens to be zero, we call this a homogeneous linear differential equation. In my calculus course, I make common use of the differential operator d over dx. This was a thing, an agent, that when applied to a function resulted in the derivative of that function, and it's a very useful notation. In differential equations, particularly for linear differential equations, using operators is again extremely convenient. Here again is the second order linear differential equation I just defined. I can think of the entire left side of the equation as the effect of an operator L. Given a function, L says, well, take the second derivative and multiply by a of t, then take the first der derivative, multiply by b of t, and then take the fun function itself and multiply by c of t, and then add these three things up. L is a differential operator, just like d over dx, but only a little bit more complicated, a bit more involved. Using L, I can rewrite the differential equation in a very succinct form, ly equals d. And again, this notation will be very valuable throughout the course. The solving of DEs is often built up from basic and important examples. When I talked about DEs in Calculus 1 and 2, I likewise started with a core example. So let me remind you of the first and most important of these, the percentage growth equation. DF over DT equals a constant alpha times the function F. The solution to the percentage growth equation is the exponential function e to the alpha t with an unknown constant c in front. This equation already includes so much that is typical of differential equations. It connects an important real-world problem, percentage growth or decay, to a mathematical function, the exponential. It shows how parameters in the equation, like the constant alpha, affect the solution, becoming the rate of growth in the exponential. It shows that there is usually another unknown in the situation that relates to a starting condition. In this case, c is the value at time equals zero. And all of these will become ideas that are repeated over and over throughout the course. In particular, the existence of the constant c. Usually to solve a differential equation completely, one or more initial conditions are required. These are pieces of information that tell where the system starts. And hopefully this makes a bit of sense. A differential equation is about derivatives, about how the function changes. To solve a DE is to understand about the dynamics, how a function grows. But it doesn't tell you where to start that growth, hence an initial condition. A differential equation with an initial condition is called an initial value problem, or IVP. If f of 0 equals 10, that initial condition lets me determine that the constant c here must also have the value 10, and then I get a unique solution, one specific function. Now I'm going to go through four other examples. I'm just going to give the solutions here, not talk about how to find them, which is the subject of the rest of the course. The point is to demonstrate the different kinds of things that might happen with a differential equation to help you build up some expectation and some intuition. Here is a second order differential equation. It asks, what function has a second derivative which, when added to nine times the original function, produces zero? The function sine of 3t has this property, as does the function cos of 3t. And feel free to check that the second derivative does actually satisfy when you put it into the equation. In addition, it turns out that any linear combination of these two solutions is also a solution. a sine of 3t plus b sine of 3t for any constants a and b. And this shows a way in which DE solutions come in families. For a second order differential equation, I usually expect a family with two parameters. The sine and cosine are the basic solutions, but then I get a whole family of solutions by combining them. 
Here is a first order DE. It's a strange one, but the function y equals t squared over 4 plus c, all squared, is a family of solutions for any value of the constant c. However, there is also the solution y equals 0, and again, feel free to take the derivatives and put the pieces in the original equation to verify that these are in fact solutions. This example shows that strange solutions can crop up. There is a family of solutions with parameter c, but also a solution that isn't in the family. No value of c will give the solution y equals 0 in the family, and such, such extra solutions are often called singular solutions. Here is another example of a singular solution. The family y equals ct to the 4 solves this differential equation for any number c. However, there are also strange piecewise solutions, such as a function that is t to the 4 for the positive numbers and negative t to the 4 for the negatives. This is a singular solution, and it turns out that there are many more singular solutions to this equation as well. Finally, here is a differential equation with an implicit solution. The DE implies that y is a function of x. We're looking for a function y with independent variable x. However, sometimes solutions will get expressed implicitly in equations where the dependent variable is not isolated. I could isolate y in this question, which would give solutions that actually look like functions. But often the implicit solutions are the more elegant way to express the situation. Again, these examples are just to get you thinking about a differential equation and its solutions, about what can happen, and about what we might expect in the course. I want to end this video with some broader thoughts about DEs. As mathematicians, there tend to be two ways we think in general about problems. We can think like pure mathematicians, or like applied mathematicians. A pure mathematician is just interested in the patterns of the mathematics. They might ask these kinds of questions. When does a solution exist? Can I prove that a solution exists? Is the solution unique? Is there a complete family of solutions and how many parameters exist? What are their domains? Can I write and prove theorems to answer these questions? This attitude is very valuable since it leads to the development of a robust and rigorous theory. And it's also just really interesting to those of us who love mathematical patterns. There's also the applied mathematics perspective. And an applied mathematician might ask these questions. How many solutions fit the data or initial values? How do the solutions grow? What is their behavior? Are the solutions stable? How difficult are the solutions to calculate? Can I calculate them exactly or only approximately? Can I answer questions about the model without even having an explicit solution? These are practical questions. Many DEs arrive from real world problems and I want to be able to use the theory to answer those real problems as best I can. Throughout the course, we'll use both perspectives and the subject is not complete without both. We want a robust theory but also a useful and efficient problem-solving tool, and we will get both. Finally, I want to strangely end this introductory video on a pessimistic note. Consider this example. This DE can be solved just by integrating, but when I look at that integral, I run into trouble. This is an integral without any elementary function solutions. Without defining some new functions, this is as far as I can go. And unfortunately, this is often the case. Many, many DEs simply don't have solutions among the functions we already know. There is a scarcity, in a sense, of solutions to DEs. And this is an important perspective to carry into the course, to know that many DEs we write down are unsolvable. Well, sort of. Unsolvable by functions we already know, but often they are solvable if we allow ourselves to define some new functions. This raises some fascinating questions about what a solution actually is and about what unsolvable means. And I'll return to these questions throughout the course.